Okay, the orchestra. In this particular video, I want to talk about the orchestra and how it actually works. Um, this is more for people who aren't necessarily uh, musically trained, but want to be able to appreciate the stuff that they listen to. So I'm going to start by giving, by just making th three points, just to make sure that we're on the same page. Uh, first, fundamentals. I'm not going to be getting too deep I into this. Um, essentially, I only want to look at the basics because I want to make this as accessible as possible. Um, the idea is that I'm assuming you have little to no music theory knowledge. Now, as we explore a bit deeper, I will touch on a bit of uh, music theory here and there. <clears throat> but yeah, the second point um, is that this is not going to be an exhaustive explanation at all. Okay, look, people study this type of stuff for many years uh, before they start actually working in the um, field. And we don't have time, right? This is meant to be a relatively short and simple exp explanation. I'm kind of looking to get this done in sort of around about 30 minutes. So I'm going to be leaving out a lot of technical and uh, musicological information. Okay. But the point is, at least you'll have a springboard, sort of a starting point for understanding orchestration and arrangement. And then the third point that we need to understand is that there are lots of kinds of orchestras. And orchestras in general are adjustable. I mean, they come in different sizes, and in some cases they might contain different instruments as well. The orchestra that we are looking at is the standard symphony orchestra, which, as you can see, we've got three sections. Here. We have our woodwinds, that's that section, uh, brass section, and string section. You do also get a percussion section, but we're not going to be talking about that um, because, well, to be honest, it kind of deserves its own video. But percussion would come in uh, between brass section and string section on the sheet music. Now how about we zoom in a little bit and focus on the string section over here. The string section has three roles. The first role is that it is the foundation of the entire ensemble. It is the water and flower of our bread. It is the body. It's the workhorse. Okay. The second role is dynamics. It's a very useful thing to have in your back pockets. Um, because your string section is the most, well, it's the biggest section in the orchestra. And this gives it the power to drive an orchestra if need be. So I just wanted to show you an example. Yeah, you are still, okay, great. So, um, Anthem starts out, it's a brass section piece. It's led by the brass section. So we've got our horns playing. And when the piece starts out, the only thing that's playing in the string section is our double basses. But I want to just fast forward to when we start to build into it this is um, as we introduce our cellos and listen to how we can build up and how we can expand you hear that? Now we've brought in our violins and our violas. <clears throat> and then we get to one more moment, which is really going to show you how you can use strings. And that's the second part of this, by the way, is strings are very useful to pull things in, to make it more intimate, I guess is the, the right word. So let's fast forward. There is a section where there's one lone trumpet. Ah, at this point, yeah. So we have the whole orchestra playing, and then you're going to see everything is going to be pulled out. So we're just going to have one lone trumpet. So if you visualize it, you can imagine just one guy standing by himself, almost like a one-on-one -on -one deal. It's, it's Then we bring in the rest of the orchestra to build it up again. 
but our violins aren't playing yet because we're not ready to really push it and now So really, strings can be used to swell so magnificently. Are we on the same page? Yes, we are. Okay. <laughs> so. Oh, yeah. There is one more role to talk about. And that is rhythm. So that means I'm going to have to quickly load up uh, rhythm for you. Um, where is it? That's the piece. Now, what I want you to notice is have a look at what the uh, music... Okay, this is also... This is a complete orchestra notice your string section looks very busy this is what it sounds like so we're actually creating a sense of rhythm oh, and there's a choir in here also apparently yeah we're creating a sense of rhythm with our double basses cellos and violas i want to just move on a little bit into here to give you an idea when the whole string section is playing some rhythm. <laughs> so yeah, rhythm is such a useful tool that we have. Okay, what else do we need to talk about? Alright, so now that we've discussed the roles, we can dig a little deeper and talk about the instruments themselves. Let's get back to the score. Now, the string section is divided into four different instruments. Now, I'm aware that there are five lines here, or five staves. That's just because the violins have been split into first violins and second violins, but it's the same thing, really. And for the most part, in most cases, they all play a different part of a chord. Okay, I'll get into that a little bit more in just a second. Um. One thing I will point out is that these instruments are ordered in the same order of pitch. So violins play the highest, followed by violas, followed by cellos, and then your lowest is obviously your double basses. Now what usually happens, I mean there's, there's, there's a couple ways you can plan out your strings. If, if this was a strings only piece for instance, you might play a chord with these three guys here, your double basses, cellos, and violas and you might play your melody with your violins and your second violins. I'm going to get a little bit technical for just a second but hear me out. Those of you who know music will undoubtedly uh, appreciate this more. But so let's put a chord in. Um, and then this would be an E. Okay. So in a lot of cases, if it was playing by itself, you'd have a chord like that. And I generally tend to, if the string section is the only section now, right? I generally will tend to have my roots, my um, contrabasses playing a uh, root. My cellos will play a fifth. If you put the notes too close together, it sounds muddy. And violas will tend to play a third. Okay. Um, and that way you've got the whole chord structure built up now. And that allows us room to put a melody line in uh, violas and then usually a counter melody or harmonization of some kind in uh, second violins. Nice and simple. If we this was part of a much larger ensemble though, say we had a brass section and a woodwind section, or even just one of those two, then you might get the entire string section to play chords. So what you would do is you'd have in this case, what I like to do is that, if I needed to be a more open chord, so that is to say I'm, I'm playing a, a root only an octave higher, so that's a C, and I'm playing a fifth if I want it to sound more open. Sounds like this. Oh, and then also cellos in that case will be just an octave higher than that, so you get this. Okay. If I don't want it to be as open, I can play the same chord and just make this an E. 
It's the same chord, but we've modified it slightly. Like I say, the big change, if the entire, if all five sections are part of the same chord, is my cellos will now be simply playing an octave higher than my basses. Okay. <clears throat> I'll quickly add on that one of the benefits of the string section, because it's so big, is that if you need this thing to swell, <laughs> like, more than it currently can, not the best way of saying it, but the point is, I can double up on double basses and cellos and violins. Remember, there's not just one double bass playing in this ensemble. I can divide it into two sections and have my basses playing two different octaves. And I can do the same with my cellos and the same with my violas. Okay, we don't need to divide the violins because they've already been divided up. But that way you have a range suddenly that's, instead of only over a, um, three octaves, we're now putting this thing over six octaves. Okay. <clears throat> <clears throat> and that helps us to swell even more if uh, uh, we needed to. <laughs> I don't often do that, but it is an option. Yeah, so let's move on to the woodwind section. The woodwind section <clears throat> um, is made up of flutes, oboes, clarinets, and bassoons. But before we go there, I almost forgot to mention the three roles of the woodwind section. The first is a melody. A lot of pieces in um, video game design and film design, classical music, they'll have their melody in the woodwind section and your strings will be the foundation. Okay? Um, so that's why I say the entire section can be used as a melody, especially if I'm asked to compose, um, it's for a sad scene, you know, a character's died, or sometimes it's for a happy scene. I might be told that the um, the characters are tired, but they're happy. They they they're feeling relaxed, appreciative of their uh, life. Then the woodwinds are such a brilliant way to, well, a brilliant place to put our uh, melody. Okay, the second role of our woodwind section is seasoning. Let's suppose that our melody is being played in the brass section. And so 90% of our piece is brass, is horns and trumpets and such. Occasionally, you might need to add a little salt and pepper to your piece. And that's where the woodwind section can come in. These foods can play very high. But of course, you know, just like in the baking of a cake or uh, making food, your salt and pepper is supposed to barely be noticeable. It should be more noticeable when it's not there than when it's there. You do want your woodwinds to be noticeable, but not over the top. So yeah, they are very useful for seasoning um, when you need that little bit extra. The The third role is as a support role. Um, flutes and oboes, well, the whole section is very useful in terms of harmonies and counter melodies and doubling on string parts. So let's say you have a piece where it's actually the string section that is leading. Suppose there's no brass, it's just, uh, it's just strings. It can be very useful to at some points have an oboe play the same melody line as our first violins, just to add a bit of texture. All right. Flutes are very good with harmonies and counter melodies. Okay. Let's dig a little deeper and talk about the roles of each particular instruments. They're very similar to the string section, although a little bit more complicated. But if you wanted to compare, the flutes would be closer in our range, in pitch, to violins, oboes closer to violas, clarinets closer to cellos, and bassoons, or that's your bass, that's closest to double bass. And here again, by the way, these are in order of how high they can play. The difference being that with the string section, you know, if you play um, a viola high enough, it sounds almost exactly the same as a violin. Obviously, it's not exactly the same, but it, most people, it sounds very similar, all right? Cellos, if you play them low enough, sound very similar to a double bass. That doesn't really happen in the woodwind section. I mean, the flutes have such a soft sound. The oboe has a bit more of a has a slightly harsher sound, but it's still nothing compared to brass. 
um, but it's a stronger sound also. Okay, that's why sometimes I'll have a, a melody starts in flute and then actually end up in oboe. Clarinet has, how do you explain that? It's a more earthy sound, like a deeper sound. What I'm saying is it's a very different texture to flutes and oboe. And then bassoon, well, that just sounds like bassoon. You have to really listen to it to, to know what that sounds like. It's, it's a rather unique thing. So what that means is that we don't just pick, and, pick a um, part because of a certain pitch that it needs to be in. We pick a part because of its texture. Uh, clarinets, for instance, can actually play in almost the same range as an oboe can. I mean, not quite. Obviously, oboes can play higher. And flutes and oboes can play in a similar range also. But obviously, flutes can play higher. What else can I say about the woodwind section? I think I did mention that flutes often will play melody while oboe will play counter melody. This is if our um, if this section is uh, leading the um, piece. Uh, oh, that's right. Another difference is that with your string instruments, your violins, if if your violins take lead and you have, say, violas for counter melody, you'll find the two will never switch roles. Your violas, your um, violins will stay melody, and your violas will stay counter melody. But with flutes and oboe, they will switch roles. You can have your flutes start out playing melody and oboe's counter melody, and then maybe you need the song to build up a bit. So you can actually switch them around and have oboe suddenly playing melody, and clarinet, I say switch around, that, that's said wrong, but... Oboes can be playing melody, and then now your clarinets can come in and play counter melody, and your flutes can occasionally play in some of those really high notes. Um, yeah. Or you can double up. So you can have your flute playing melody, and then you can bring your oboe in basically playing the same notes as your flute just to give it a um, richer, str um, str stronger melody. Um, and sometimes... Your clarinets might even play a melody with oboe playing counter melody and then flutes popping in from time to time to add in some high notes. The soons are really... I wish I could say more about them. Um, don't underestimate them, but they really are usually just there for bass. Unfortunately, most composers don't really give too much thought to their bassoons. It's like the humble viola. We don't really think about them too much. I think that's about all we can say about the woodwind section. So let's move on to the brass section. The brass section... Oh, wait a minute. Hang on. Whoa. There is one more thing to say about the clarinets that I forgot. And I'm going to get a little bit deeper into uh, music theory because you'll notice there's a B flat there. You see, the way you write for clarinets is not the same as the way you write for flutes or oboe or bassoon. So that's a C. And in all of these inst instruments... C sounds like a C. We'll we'll just use these as our guide. If I put a C into my clarinet, though, that would be a C, right? But it sounds different. A clarinet is actually written one tone higher than the rest of the woodwind instruments, which means if you wanted a C, you wouldn't put the notes on the sheet music as a C. You'd put it as a as a D, and then it sounds like a C. So just bear that in mind uh, when you write for um, clarinet. And it's because a clarinet is tuned to be flat. So that's, that's the purpose. I'm not going to go any deeper into that. There's, we could get technical, but let's talk about our brass section. Now, our brass section has three roles. The first role is for boldness, flair, power, for climax. Okay. <laughs> the second role of the brass section is to add richness to the melody. Something I do, and something that is done, um, is you might have a melody being played with oboes, but now you need it to be more powerful. You can actually exchange your oboe out for your French horns. French horns sound kind of similar to oboe, although a bit harsher. The third role of the brass section is to add weight and might to the orchestra. It's a call to action. So you might have a piece that's being played um, and these guys are doing a melody for you and you decide that 
you've gotten to say the climactic part of the piece. I really need to to blast this thing off. You can bring in your brass section. So it's a bit like changing gears. You're going from fourth gear into fifth gear. That's kind of what your brass section can do. It's incredible. You'd be surprised <clears throat> how much power you can add to an orchestra just by adding in a brass section. Alrighty, the brass section is the only section that is not ordered in pitch order, in that your trumpets can actually play a little bit higher than your French horns. The rest is kind of uh, uh, works out, to be honest. But you could say that your French horns are similar to violins, that your trombones are similar to cellos just in terms of pitch now. And your tuba, of course, fills in the bass. Um, double bass. Equivalent to uh, double bass. Sorry, I lost my place there in my notes. Now, trumpets tend to be louder and harsher sounding than the horns, although you can get your horns to sound harsh if you play them high enough and with enough power. Um, so horns can be used both in sort of a mellow sounding format if you're playing in your uh, lower register, but they can also be almost like the start of a battle, that sort of battle cry sound. You can get them to sound very powerful if you put it in a higher pitch and you really blast it. Um, okay, let's quickly talk tuning because you'll notice that our horns are in F and our trumpets are on B flat. Horns are tuned five tones higher than the trombones and the tuba. Okay, so let's have a listen to what that sounds like. I just want to make sure that, that we're clear about how this works. Um, you know what, we're going to use flutes and oboes again. That's our C. But if I put a C in our horns, it's like completely different. And in truth, what we have to do to get our French horns to sound like our flutes is drag it up five tones. So when your French, uh, when your your flutes and oboes on the sheet music it shows a C, on the sheet music your French horn needs to be placed in a G. It's a fifth apart. Okay, that's just something to bear in mind. Trumpets are on B flat, which is the same rule as a clarinet. It's the same deal as a clarinet. Instead of playing a C, we'd actually put it one. No, it's up, and then it sounds like a. So we actually put it on the D, right? That lines as a D, but it's it'll play as a C. I'll just. Okay. All right. Let's let's talk a little bit about how we might use these different instruments, the roles of these different. Okay. If if our brass section is leading the piece. Um. This kind of falls, I guess I want to say, in between uh, woodwinds and strings in terms of how you would uh, score this. Because you can have your French horns playing melody with your trumpets doing counter melody. And then if you need the piece to be more, um, to be bigger and louder, you might, you'd have your trumpets playing melody and your French horns playing counter melody. Trombones will tend to play harmonies. That's what they do because they kind of fill the same role as your um, cellos. Um, and tubers will tend to fill the role of the bass, tend to fill out the bass. Tuba is something else where I wish I could say more about it. It's kind of like the um, bassoon where the, it doesn't get as much love as it maybe could be by most composers. Anyways, I'm starting to ramble, so I'm going to end this ex explanation. I really hope this has been useful to you. <laughs> this is the very fundamentals. I've tried not to get too much into a music theory. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Let me know if I've made any mis mistakes. I'm always looking to learn down in the comments below. Um, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.